of Kings, how are you tonight? Let me just remind some of you that seem to have forgotten, it is Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of the Lord, and you happen to be in Jerusalem. King of Kings, how are you tonight? It's a little better. Happy to have everybody. Welcome to all of our members tonight. Welcome to all of our guests as well. All of you watching on King's Community Live and Facebook Live, we welcome you here to Jerusalem from all over the world. I know we have viewers tonight from uh, the United States, Canada, Germany as well. Finland checked in as well. We have Bulgaria tonight, and we have Hungary. Are you hungry tonight for the Word of God? It's a little segue. I did that on purpose. It's... Turn in your Bibles with me. Luke chapter 21. You want to be in two places tonight, mainly Luke 21 and Matthew 24. What an exciting time to be with you tonight as we kick off this feast season. We also want to say a special uh, welcome to Beit Rachamim and uh, Bess and Larry tonight here with the group. Uh, those of you that didn't get the announcement, you'll get it in the, in the email newsletter uh, that Beit Rachamim has now joined the family of ministries here at King of Kings. We're so happy to have you guys in the audience tonight. Welcome uh, to our family. You can learn a little bit more about their ministry at the network website, kkm.network. It's going to be a great season. We have lots of things in store. We have a series we're going to call Look to the Sky uh, during this whole month of the feast and the festivals. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We need his help tonight. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we're asking that you help us tonight to have our hearts open, to have our minds open, to be sharp and ready to be paying attention, God, that for the next few minutes that we would not be in competition with any other thoughts, but the thoughts that the Holy Spirit wants us to meditate on tonight. Let your word come alive. Let it be clear to us. Let it touch us in our hearts. Let it call us to action tonight. We need your help. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen and amen. At the close of the sermon tonight, we will be calling the children back in as we light the Shabbat candles because tonight is a special Sabbath because, as you know, we are moving now into uh, the Feast of Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah is a little bit more accurate uh, name that we call it in the Bible, the Feast of of trumpets, so Yom Teruah as well. Let's just recap the Feast of the Lord. The year starts, God's year, the biblical year starts in the spring with Pesach. Two weeks into the new year, we have Passover. Uh, we also celebrate unleavened bread throughout that week. Three days later, we have first fruits, right? Yeshua died on Passover season. He was in the grave for three days, taking away our sin, which is linked to the leaven. Uh, on unleavened bread, he's taking away our sin, and he rises again on the feast of first fruits. That's why Paul proclaimed him the first fruits from the dead. Then we have a few uh, weeks. We get to 50 days of counting the Omer to Shavuot, the feast of weeks. The Holy Spirit comes. We've been given the law of God. It's all good. We have the power that we need to accomplish the commission that he's told us to accomplish. Then you get the summer months off. You get to go to the beach. You get to go to the water parks. Your kids are out of school. Yeah, you don't get a lot of hallelujahs for that right there. <laughs> Say the kids are out of school. Nobody wants to amen on that one. You know, you're, the Jewish people are counting the Omer to the feast of Shavuot, but the parents are counting the days until we go back to school. You understand how that works? I'm sure there's a blessing in the Jewish prayer book for that. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who counts the days until the children go back to school. Amen, amen. We take the summer off and we arrive tonight at the Feast of Trumpets. A few more days, in 10 days, we'll arrive at the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And then five days after that, we will launch into Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll celebrate that for seven days plus one. And then we get to celebrate the rolling back of the scrolls at Simchat Torah. So join us for all of those feasts and festivals. But tonight, we're going to look to the sky. Why do we look to the sky? Because it's, it's where we look for the hope of Yeshua's return and his gift of salvation. When we speak of Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, it is generally thought of as a joyous time, a time of celebration. We think of all the different ways that the Bible teaches us to use the trumpets, right? 
we think of the gathering, which are the commandments of why we use the trumpet and the shofar. We gather and we blow the trumpet to assemble the people. That's a gathering. We blow the trumpet to gather the people for worship like we did tonight. We blow the shofar to gather the people for war, which we're going to do in a little while. Bet you didn't know you came to go to war tonight, did you? If you came to see a show tonight, I'm sorry, that's not what you're going to get. We're going to get prepared for battle tonight, amen? We also use the shofar in the scriptures to announce that the king has come back into town. And I think that's the deepest prophetic significance that we find in Yom Toah is that we're announcing the return of the king. And we're going to be going through several scriptures about that tonight as well. We also use the trumpet to announce that the bridegroom has returned and he's ready to have his wedding with his bride. All of those imageries you can find in the scriptures themselves. These are positive thoughts. They're happy thoughts. Victorious thoughts even. Let's read a few verses just to kick us off tonight. Luke chapter 21, verse 27 and 28. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. You see, that speaks of Yeshua coming back in the clouds, in power and in glory. It tells us to look to the sky, because that's where our salvation comes. We don't look to the earth. It's not here. That's what the world's trying to do right now. It's trying to look here for salvation and happiness and joy. But that's not where it is. It's in the sky because that's where he's coming from. I'll add a few more sprinkled scriptures on top, but you stay in the two main sections, Luke 21, Matthew 24. I'll read this from 1 Corinthians 15. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Notice the, the emphasis on the last trumpet is when the end of the age is introduced. That's the deepest prophetic significance of the Feast of Trumpets, that it, it's the end of the age. We will hear this trumpet. It will blow. Another one, Revelation 1.7. Look, he, Yeshua, is coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Did you catch what it said? Every eye will see him. Even those that pierced him, every eye will see him, and they will mourn. Wait, Pastor Chad, you, you started with such a positive track tonight. You gave us so many good things and good thoughts, and they were fun, and we really liked this holiday a moment ago. But now you just read, and you said that when the trumpet blows, the earth will mourn. I thought this was a happy holiday. Why are we mourning? Why are we sad? Why are we in tears about this great holiday? Well, that's what we're going to ask tonight, and that's the question we're going to answer. That is our journey together. It says here that every eye will see him. Friends, no one can escape the reality of Yeshua's return. No one can escape the reality of Yeshua's return. But I don't believe in him. Too bad. Every eye will see him. I don't want to see him. Too bad. It doesn't say only if you want to keep your eyes open. It says every eye will see him. Even the ones that pierced him. Even the ones that rejected him, even the ones that disagree with everything Yeshua stands for, too bad. Your eyes will be open and every eye will see him on his return. That's why there will be mourning, because you can't avoid it. It's a return that demands a response. Matthew 24, 27 says it this way, for as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will it be on the coming of the Son of Man. You see, Yeshua's return will be seen by everyone on this planet. Just like you can see from the east to the west, when lightning strikes or, or a light shines or a star falls, you're going to see it no matter where you are. Even if you don't want to see it too bad, you have to see it because 
Yeshua's return will demand a response. Some of us will see it and rejoice because we know what's coming next. He comes on the clouds with great power and glory, and we've been waiting for this moment. We've been looking for Rosh Hashanah all year long. King Yeshua, come back. Bridegroom Yeshua, we're ready to marry you today. We're excited, and at the same time that we're celebrating his return, it demands a response from everyone else also. You don't get to stay neutral and emotionless and stone-faced when Yeshua returns. That's not an option we get. You will either rejoice for what's about to come, or you will mourn what's about to come. Because when he returns, the revelation will hit everybody of what's just happened. Seeing Yeshua's return at the last trumpet of Yom Teruah will demand a response. Let's get back to this idea of people mourning and being sad. We're reminded, first of all, that when Yeshua was with us, there was the last Passover Seder before his, uh, his crucifixion, before he was murdered, uh, and he suffered for us. We remember this passage in Luke 22. It says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So here's a quote. Even as the last Passover initiated the beginning of the new covenant age, so the final trumpet sound will culminate the end of this age. You see, both bookends of the New Covenant age have significant symbolism to them. They have events that are significant. One was the, the Seder meal with the Lord himself. And when he said, take this cup, this is my blood. This is the New Covenant in my blood. Tonight it begins. Everything you've read about, everything the prophets told you is true. It's in me and it starts tonight. Now drink this cup. Be part of what I'm doing. And the clock started ticking. When the clock ends, it will be at the last trumpet because that's the culmination of the end of the age. It began with the Passover and it ends with Yom Teruah. I hope everyone in this room and everyone watching online understands how significant the feast days of the Lord are because they set the timetable. They set all the symbolism we need for the revelation of what God is doing and how we're supposed to participate in what he's doing. Yeshua says this in Matthew 24, verse 3. It says, as Yeshua was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Ooh, that's a loaded question. That is a tough question. There's a, you understand when you unlock that, that waterfall, how much water is about to come out of that? Hey, Yeshua, tell us of the things that are going to happen before the end of the age. I can just, you know, I'm going to get over here out from behind the pulpit for a minute because I'm going to give you my interpretation of what Yeshua might have done when he was asked that question. Hey, Yeshua, tell us. What are the signs before the end of the age? Y'all really want to know that? Are you sure you want to open that can? Yeah, we do. We want to know. Tell us, what are the signs? We want to be ready. Okay, that's Matthew 24, verse 3. The next 28 verses are about what's coming. And here's a summary. There will be false messiahs. There will be wars, famines, earthquakes, persecution of believers. Many will turn away from the faith. There will be false prophets. There will be an increase in wickedness. There will be the abomination of desolation. There will be great distress. The darkened sun and moon will appear. Stars will fall out of the sky and terror will be everywhere on the earth. Now, aren't you glad you asked? This is what will happen before the end of the age. It's interesting here because sometimes you can see the future, tell the future, and not be the cause of the future. You understand what I mean? Uh, several weeks ago, if you go back in the archives, we did a sermon on the difference between the macro will of God and the micro will of man. The macro will of God, you can't change. How it's going to unfold, the need for salvation, what sin looks like, you can't change any of that. 
What you can change is how you act, how you react, your choices in life, etc., how you love and serve people. You can change the micro-level will that you have, but you can never change the macro-level will of God. But here, Yeshua is asked a question, and he looks into the future, and he says, this is the macro. I'm giving you the macro picture. This is what will happen on the planet. All of these bad things will happen. They'll be concerning to you. It'll be troublesome. And at the same time, as he's telling us what will happen, he's letting us know, I'm not the cause. I'm not causing them. You can have knowledge of the future without causation. Let that help you in your theological study. You can have knowledge of the future without causation. You can tell us what's coming without causing what's coming. And in this case, this is what Yeshua is doing. He's saying, guys, this is what I see. Now, some people have trouble because that can be a deep theological component. And I don't mean to get too deep with you tonight, but if I give you an example, maybe it'll make it a little bit easier. I have a bunch of kids. They're, they're, we're having more and more, so their house is getting more and more full. And one of my kids really loves animals. And so we're getting more animals, too, all around the house. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you how many animals we have at this point. So I'm not even going to tell you. But just yesterday, uh, number two and number three were on the couch, laying down opposite one another with their feet touching. You with me? You see this picture? My, you're in my living room now. You with me? You're in my living room. There's a couch. My number two and number three are laying on the couch, and feet are touching one another. Oh, guess what's coming? Oh, we're going to play footsies. Oh, that's fun. Let's, let's ratchet this up a notch. We're going to start kicking one another now. You see where I'm going with this? Oh, that's fun. Oh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Somebody's going to win this little kicking game. Dad sees it and looks over and says, guys, if you don't stop, here's what's going to happen. Somebody's going to kick someone too hard. Someone else is going to get mad and kick back, and then we're going to want to fight one another. And what was a little bit of a game has turned into a little bit of a war. I am telling the future without causation. I didn't make them fight, but certainly five minutes later they did. <laughs> Parents have this ability to see the future without causing it. And so does God. And so when they asked this of Yeshua, he said, all right, you may not want to hear this, but here's the answer. All of these things are going to happen. And listen to what it says after the summary that I just gave you. Same chapter, Matthew 24, verse 30 and 31. After all these things, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. There's the shofar. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. I don't know if you've ever seen this as much as we've studied the word together, but normally when I study the Feast of Trumpets, it's a joyous occasion. And I was interested that this season, as I kept studying, the Lord kept bringing me back to how many times it says the people will mourn. There's a very different quiet time for me this year than years past. And the, and the word of the Lord is rich. It's always alive. You got to stay in it. You got to stay in it because as you change, the word of God will reveal something new to you. My oldest daughter, daughter number one. You're going to get the stories whether you want them or not. I, daughter number one, she mentioned to me this week that there, there was a comedian telling a joke, and she said to me, hey, you know that joke that we've said back and forth to each other? Yeah. You know how I always laugh at it? I said, yeah. She said, I just got it. <laughs> and she said, I mean, it was, it was funny before I got it, because I got it a little bit. But now that I'm a little bit older, I got the context of the joke. It was funny when I was a little kid. But now that I'm older, I really get what he meant. And I said, well, that's, keep that principle. Because that's how the word of God is. That's how the spirit of God works. As we mature, we get a little bit older. We gain new experience and context. You go back to reading the same passage, and all of a sudden, it's got brand new meaning to you. And this year, friends, that's what's happening to me. 
I'm reading the word, I'm like, wow, I can't believe how many times it says on the last trumpet call people will mourn. I just, in my head, for some reason, I pictured this big party, but it's a lot of mourning going on. Revelation 1.7 mentioned it. Matthew 24 mentions it. Zechariah 12.10 reads this way. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Now listen, don't mistake this verse that at his return there's crying because we're so happy. It's not that kind of crying. We're not crying because we're so happy. This is mourning. The example they used here was about a child dying and the loss of the firstborn. If you've studied any type of psychology and the grief process, you will understand that most professionals will say the deepest grief you can have is losing a child. So that's the example. Not a little bit of mourning, not happy tears. The example that was thought by the Holy Spirit to be put in the Bible at the return of the Messiah while some people are happy and some people are mourning, the mourning style, the pain, the example that was chosen was the loss of your only child, the deepest pain you can experience. That's what's going to happen to people who don't know the Messiah. The deepest internal pain possible is what's going to happen to people who don't know the Messiah. They will be able to identify that they rejected him. They will all, with us along with them, they will identify that our sin added to his suffering. They will mourn as one mourns for an only child or a firstborn son. The loss of a child. Because why? Because Yeshua's return demands a response. There will be a realization that our sin collectively caused pain and death to enter the world. There will be a reality when they're faced with his return that they were wrong. Everything we put our, our stake into, everything we put our emphasis on in, in life, if we don't put it in the Messiah Yeshua, we will realize at that moment that we were wrong, that our whole life went the wrong direction. And all of a sudden, there's revelation that we were wrong. And we're demanded a response by his return. We introduced decay to humanity. We were implicit altogether in the suffering of the Messiah. And it wasn't just, as Romans says, it wasn't just one time someone told us about the Lord and we said no. No, Romans says every man is without an excuse. They can see the reality of who God is and his invisible attributes and throughout all of creation. Which means the people who have rejected Messiah reject him every day. They haven't rejected him once. They reject him continually. Every time the Holy Spirit comes back to them and tries to touch him, they reject him again. And it's that revelation, it's that realization that's going to happen at the last trumpet call, which is why they mourn, which is why we have sadness and tears like the loss of a child. They will realize that they were deceived, that everything they ran after was of little value. Luke 21 25 and 26 says this, there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring of, and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Did you catch it? There will be anguish, perplexity, apprehension of what is coming, because as soon as they recognize that they were wrong... They will remember all of the things they were wrong about, including what's coming next. And this deep, gut-wrenching <gasps> will hit them. You know the feeling. As humans, I'm sure we all know this feeling. When something of a revelation hits you all of a sudden, and it's big, and it's important, and sometimes it's bad. It's a sinking feeling in your stomach. It doesn't feel good. It makes you instantly want to feel sick. You know that feeling? Sometimes it'll wake you up in the middle of the night. You forgot to do something. It has a deadline. I call that Thursday. 
You know, one time, I'm going to tell on myself for a second. Can I tell on myself for a little bit? So in, 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 in pastoral work, sometimes you, you, you can get really focused on what you're doing, what you think the Lord has called you to do. And this one particular Shabbat morning, I was leading the service, and I was preaching, and we had guests, and my, my wife typically comes a little bit after I come to service because I get there a lot earlier, and I leave a lot later, and she has the children, and so she's going to come later than I will, and then she'll leave a little bit earlier than I will, and so she brings the children. This one particular Shabbat, she came as normal, and she had the two babies with her, but we still had our oldest one, and she said to me, I'm going to bring the babies home. I think one of them isn't feeling well. Why don't you, I'm going to leave the oldest one with you. They're going to go to class. Just bring her home. Great. So I do, I do this great sermon, I suppose, and I meet the people, and we have our meetings, and I go through my regular routine, and I'm on the freeway going home, and I'm, all, I'm almost all the way home. And the phone rings, you know, and because I'm such a good citizen, I pull over to answer the phone. Yeah, good. Some of you got that. And I didn't even need to pick up the phone. Oh, I just forgot my child. The sickness just ran over me. Oh, this is probably going to scar my child for a while. How much inner healing are they going to need after this? That dad, dad loves everyone else in the congregation, but he forgets his own child. And right after that person called, because they're the ones at the congregation uh, waiting with my child until I could return, faithful friend, I didn't pick up because I knew what was had, just spun it around. You know who the next call was from. My sweet wife, I don't think I picked up that one either. I didn't want to yeah, answer, no, pick that one up. Just text her back, meeting running late, you know, I'll be back soon. But you know the feeling, that sinking, it feels gross, it, it hurts, and, and, and it catches you all of a sudden. And it, it changes your thought pattern, it changes your world for that moment. And there's going to be millions who feel it. The one they didn't believe in, the trumpet will sound and they're going to see him because every eye sees him. And that demands a response and they will have an immediate sinking, sick feeling. Now we've listed a lot of things about what will happen before the last trumpet will sound and there's a few more we should mention. Luke 21, 24 says this. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Keep that in mind. What does it mean, time of the Gentiles? Romans eleven twenty five. 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. So now we have a, a time of the Gentiles. We have this thing called the full number of the Gentile or the fullness of the Gentiles. Matthew 24, 9 says, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all the nations because of me. That's another piece of good news. What will happen before the end of the age? It continues, verse 14. And this gospel of Yeshua and his kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. It's not hard to know when the end will come. It's right there. We get all the signs. All the road signs are there. And the last one is this, the full number of the Gentiles have come in, whatever that means to us. All nations have heard about the message of Yeshua because that's why no one has an excuse. And that's why every eye will look to the sky and they will see him and they will either rejoice or have a sick feeling in their stomach and begin to mourn at his return on this festival day. You know, friends, the... The challenge sometimes is to watch our loved ones try everything else. 
They've looked to idols in the ancient times and substances, material things, science, education. They've looked to all that for answers. They've looked to selfishness and sin and sex and power and fame and even entertainment. They've looked to the created things, to the stars, and finally, to themselves. It's kind of like a game. I try to play a lot of games with my kids, and it's, it's kind of like a puzzle game, a card game. You ever played one of those games where there's a lot of options in the game, but at some point, if you don't choose the right path to victory, you will run out of options in the game, and the game will tell you, I'm sorry, you're out of options. The game is now over. That's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Mankind will have tried every move possible. And when the last move has been tried, and the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, all the nations on the earth hate the believers, and every move has been tried, Yeshua will return. And he'll say, I'm sorry, you're out of moves now. His return demands a response. Now, while the Feast of Trumpets is a great rejoicing time for many, we focus tonight on the fact that for millions others, it's a time of mourning. And you say, that's just such a depressing message. I don't like this message, Pastor Chad. I like your other sermons. I don't like what you're doing tonight. I don't like this. Well, listen, what I'm doing is a very Jewish thing. It's to remember the challenges and the tragedy even in the, the times of celebration. Not to be a downer, but to remember the task that is at hand. You see, we can't get so caught up in our future celebration and all the parties that we want to plan to forget about how many millions won't get to join us. It's like at a Jewish wedding. How many of you have ever been to a Jewish wedding under the chuppah? It's a great time to go to a Jewish wedding. There's a lot of richness to it. But even in the celebration and the, and the bride is walking around, the groom, and there's the seven blessings are being read or they're being sung and they're signing the, the ketubah or, or the songs and, and the candles are being lit. Whatever you're doing, it's a lot of fun. And at some point, they bring out the glass and the groom stomps on the glass and he shatters it. And a lot of tradition will tell you that that is to never forget the destruction of the temple. To never forget the destruction of our people throughout all the, the persecution of the ages. That even in celebration, that before we celebrate, it's the last thing we do before we announce this couple is now married. In a Jewish wedding, you break the glass because you want to remember that there's still a challenge for the Jewish people as well. And tonight, that's what we're doing. We are celebrating the return of the king. We're blowing the trumpets tonight to celebrate his goodness. But we're also needing to remember how many will mourn. Because those that mourn need you. They need you to do your job and my job. They need us to share the message of salvation with people who have tried everything else so that they will be ready to celebrate with us during this time. That's a call to action. And I sense the Holy Spirit is saying, take action right now. Can you stand up with me? Worship team, go ahead. How many in the room tonight have a relative that does not know Yeshua yet? Can you raise your hand? Keep your hands up. How many in the room tonight have a friend who does not know Yeshua yet? So at this point, we should have almost every hand, if not every hand up. This Yom Teruah, we're going to go to war. This trumpet is a call to war. Let's begin to intercede. Let's call them out by name. We're going to pray right now. Listen, there's only a few times in a service where we get to do things together. We get to do things together in worship, and we get to do things together in intercession. Let's pray together right now in the name of Yeshua. Yeshua, save our loved ones. Save our friends and our family. We call out for their salvation. In your holy name, Holy Spirit, come in this room. Intercessors, begin to lift your voices. Let's begin to battle for their salvation. Father, let more people join us in celebration. 
Let their eyes be open this Rosh Hashanah season. Let their eyes be open, God. Let us live lives of purity and power in front of them. We call them out of the grave by name. Save your loved ones. Save your children, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, one thought that came to me. was the thought of, of what Yeshua's face would look like at the same time. Because when the last trumpet sounds and there's a realization of how many people are not coming with him, I can guarantee you that even though one side is celebrating Yeshua's face, he will mourn. Do you understand? Because to him it will be the loss of a child. To the Father in heaven it will feel like the loss of a child. Because of how many are not coming with him. So I'm not just asking us to focus on the people who will mourn. I'm asking us to focus our intercession on the fact that our God will be mourning. How many people are lost? Thank you, Lord. Let's just continue for one more minute in intercession. Call out their names. Father, break through. Holy Spirit, come and break through. Whatever blocks them, God, remove it from their path. Whatever hurt is in their life, heal it, God. Yeshua, show yourself to be real. Show yourself to be real, God. Show yourself to be real, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Today is a, it's a Sabbath. We're about to enter into this special God-appointed day. We're so happy you've been able to join us, but remember, this is a, a day that God appointed, which means if you will spend time with him, I guarantee he will show up. How can I have that much confidence? Because he guaranteed it, that he would come and visit us. He would come and connect with us on his appointed times. There's a few blessings, and then I've asked Ula to light the candles. Baruch atah Adonai lohinu melech haolam, shehechianu v'kiyamanu v'higianu lazman hazeh, amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us life, sustained us, and brought us to this holiday season. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshanu bidboro, benatan lano et yeshu meshichinu, v'tzivanu lehiot or leolam. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your word, given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshanu bidborecha, Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and has commanded us to hear the sound of the shofar. Are you ready for this? Derek, would you come up? Thank you, Ula. I've asked Pastor Derek to come up. He leads us in the Asian prayer house. We're going to do three traditional calls, and then we're going to close with what we call a tekiah gedolah, the great call, and then we're going to go into a time of worship. There won't be any prayer at the altar tonight because the healing pools are open, so if you do need prayer between services, you can join us on the 14th floor of the prayer tower for our healing pools. Now, you do have a job here. We're going to do three traditional calls, and then we're going to do the final call, and our worship team is going to take us into a song, but when you hear the final call... Your job is to shout hallelujah. 
That is your job. We're making a memorial. That's the commandment. Blow the trumpets to make a memorial. Make this day special. Make it stand out beyond anything else. Your job is to shout hallelujah at the end of it. Takia. Shabarim. Tarua. Takia Gadola. Hallelujah! Hallelujah!